Hello, I'm Susan Dunlop and welcome to episode 10 of Coffee and Contemplation with Women. Uh, if you haven't been tuned into the series so far, it is a series of conversations or chats with women from every decade of life, from denarians, you know, 10 to 19 year olds, to hopefully we will find a super centenarian, you know, 110 to 119 year old once COVID-19 is over. Uh, today we are going to speak with the youngest of our guests so far. Uh, Lucy Bolas is 18. And she's the daughter of Linda Lee Wilkie, who was the guest of episode eight recently, uh, the woman from Dolby who talked on Christianity and sexuality and the magic of the country town in which she lives. So Lucy is the older sister of triplets. As I said, she's 18, they're 15. And she put her hand up when she was helping set up Linda Lee for the chat the other week when she realised what we were going to be doing as part of the series. And she said, basically, I've got a story to tell that will hopefully give hope and encouragement to other girls and women. Um, I'm a big sister of triplet siblings. I have lesbian parents. I'm now co-parented across two homes. I've suffered anxiety and depression for the past four years. And my boyfriend is away in Canberra. COVID-19 is getting in the way of the plans for 2020. So welcome, Lucy. Hi, how are you? I'm oh, really good, thank you. I'm so glad that you actually said yes, because I was wondering who the hell I'd actually get on that would be a 10 to 19 who'd be willing to have a, a good chat. So, yeah, I really appreciate you putting your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I was a bit worried at the start because I didn't know if I had anything interesting, but I thought about it and I just thought, you know what, there's someone out there who can relate somewhere. Yeah, and that's what's coming up out of all the um the sessions so far. People are just picking up on one thing or two things and... um. I think from just getting to know you in the last couple of weeks, I think you have got some um, some pretty cool stuff to share for a woman of your age, what you've experienced and even how much you've grown already at this stage of your life. So what I was thinking was, okay, let's, we'll cover COVID-19 straight up because obviously we are in the middle of COVID-19. You are homeschooling, you triplet, yeah. 15 year olds. Um, so your plan for 2020 hasn't probably gone as planned. Tell me what's happening this year compared to what you wanted to have happen. Um, so it's done a complete flip altogether, I would say. I started this year um, going to taste for beauty therapy uh, in Toowoomba. And while I was doing that, I, I do still enjoy beauty and it's something that I like, but I wanted to do something that would uh, be more fulfilling and I wanted to be able to help people um and I've always had like inside me I've always wanted to do teaching and so I've now just decided to start a course at uni in Canberra um as we're doing early childhood and primary education so it's a total flip new state new course everything so being a sister of triplets, how old were you? Yeah. How old are you? So you're what four years difference, three years difference? Three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was three when they were born. Okay. Um, and that's not put you off becoming a teacher of children. Ah, uh, no. Surprisingly, not. It hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> what What is it that's um made you shift towards becoming a teacher? What was it that was a, a turning point? Um, so I studied kinesiology early this year. I started going to a kinesiologist. And one of the things we talked about was like what I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to take myself in that journey. And we realised that beauty therapy, yes, it was something I enjoyed, but I wanted more. And we looked at where I found enjoyment and I found that in helping people, especially younger kids, and I really wanted to have an impact on them that would stay with them for the rest of their lives sort of thing. Mm. So I really wanted to be there to help someone build their life up, like right from the beginning, give them that sort of foundation. How do you feel your life um, was with the, you made the shift from um, from up in Northern Territory, I think when I first met you was a little league, um, and then you came to the Sunshine Coast and obviously um, found out you were going to be a big sister to 
three little babies and then you moved out yeah. to Dolby. <laughs> um, so how has all that, has that impacted you? Like I was just saying, what you'd like to do is have a positive impact on children. How do you feel all that impacted your life? Uh, well, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't remember much. I don't remember anything about being in the Northern Territory. I remember a little bit of being at Sunshine Coast, but being in Dolby, because I spent my whole, like my whole life, I've been with these kids and I've been there helping mum raise them from when they were tiny to now. So I've always had this relationship with them, them being my best friends, even with the three year difference. Um, so I've, that's really given me a huge impact in where I wanted to go with my life because I've always been with these younger people and I've always been there to help them sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I've seen you just on, on obviously, the, the side when we see our lives of each family's crossover on Facebook and it always seems like yeah, your family environment was just one full of just love and just yeah. good, good old-fashioned stuff that you, you know, put on little concerts and all sorts of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We did a lot of stuff like that. I will admit some of it, now I look back at it, a bit embarrassing, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw an Australia Day parade or something. That was cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you see yourself as a role model to the kids or are you just, what do, you, what do you think they look at you like? Um, I guess in some ways I am a role model. But I think we see each other more as best friends more than role models. Okay. Um, like we obviously, we do learn a lot from each other, but I see it more as like a friendship between the four of us, yeah. That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so in relation to, um, so right now, you were going to go to uni now, but you couldn't because of COVID-19. Is that what's happened? Yeah, so I was going to start uni in July. Um, I was going to start midway through the year. But because of all the uncertainties with COVID-19, I'm most likely going to have to defer until next year. Okay. Um, which has kind of made it a struggle with some things yeah. because they have nothing to do between now and next year. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. And your boyfriend's yeah. not in town where you are either is he no. down there already um so he's in camera he was meant to come home for the easter holidays but they obviously aren't allowed to leave at all so i won't be seeing him until everything is lifted oh. which is hard yeah how are you maintaining yeah. that relationship with him um so we have like skype calls every night so we're talking to each other every day so it's not the worst thing in the world Oh, okay. Um, we write letters to each other as well. Oh, lovely. We, yeah, we like to do that. So it's a bit of, um, so there's something physical from each other that we've mm. obviously put time and effort into for the other person. It's something that you can hold, which is, you know, nice too. Yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about that, that um, with good old fashioned letter writing. Um, yeah. Back in the old days, it was pretty amazing to actually get a letter from someone and, you know, share it amongst people and, um, but it's nice as a, a young couple to be able to do that at the beginning of your yeah year. yeah yeah hey um so you, you've mentioned that you've had a battle with anxiety and depression um do you want to speak a little bit about that uh yeah so my battle started towards the end of grade nine the start of grade 10 sort of around that time um unfortunately I lost both my grandparents so on Anthea's died. Um, I lost them within the space of six months, mm. which was really hard for me because um, they were my best friends. Like, I grew up with them before the triplets came, they were my best friends. Um, yeah. I remember that with your nan, she was very, very um, loving and in your space all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I lost my nan first which was really tough. And then I lost my granddad on my 15th birthday, which was oh. also really tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mum wasn't here for that. She had to be in New South Wales to be with him, which was tough as well, not having her here. But 
it was more important to have her down there with him. Um, so that's where it all came on losing my best friends and my grandparents. Mm. And I really struggled at school. I'd say I was pretty good. I was a pretty good student, like an A B student without trying sort of thing. Um, but after losing them, I really slipped out of school. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't get to school. I was failing classes. Um, when I did go to school, I never saw anyone. I sat in the guidance counselor's office. Oh. Just sat there, did nothing. Um, did home, were you talking about your feelings at home? Yeah, so as soon as the feelings came up, I went straight to mum. Okay. There was no waiting because I had, I've had a lot of education on mental illnesses and knowing that I was such a, like a bright and happy person all the time to suddenly be hit with this massive wave of grief and these like, like feelings of depression and anxiety. I knew, look, something's not right here. I need to speak up. Um, so I went to mum and we started talking about it straight away. We decided to go see a psychologist and that wasn't helping at all. It felt really, it wasn't easy to sit down and talk with this person that I didn't know and just share my whole life story and everything about me and like my feelings. And so I really struggled with that. I felt more forced to go to these sessions rather than wanting to go voluntarily to help myself. So I had been to, over the last three years, I've been to three or four different therapists and they all felt the same for me it was all it felt forced it was all mechanical it was all clinical it wasn't all the questions were the same everybody asked the same thing and they all said oh yeah what you're feeling is normal but it wasn't normal I didn't feel normal and having these people sit there and tell me you know you're what you're feeling it's normal we can fix you but it's normal were they were they coming up with strategies or anything for you or was it just that they listened to you and said that eventually you'll be okay? Um, there were some strategies, like the same things. It was, uh, why don't you just try this breathing technique or why don't you just count these numbers over and over in your head, stuff like that. And it's like, it gets to a point sometimes where little things like that don't help. They'll, hurt. They'll help for like the short amount of time that I'm feeling anxious, but it's nothing that'll help me in like a long space of time really mm. um so that was really tough I didn't get much out of those sessions they were all full and so over the years I think I've relapsed four five six times so I've gotten better but I haven't gotten back to the person I was before I always had those feelings of anxiety and depression. They just weren't as strong as they originally were. Okay. And it would get to times where it got really, really bad. But then I'd slowly get out of it and then dip back into it again, which was really quite frustrating because I could feel times where I'm like really, really happy. And then the next day I'll just be like back down this slope again and just feel horrible and not want to climb out of bed. Um, and so the start of this year, when my boyfriend left to join ADFA. Um, the first three weeks or so was a was a massive training for all the first years. So we had no contact with him for like three, four weeks, which was really tough because I had gone from seeing him every single day to not hearing from him for yeah. a massive You're length alone. of time. Yeah, so that's when we started writing the letters which was good, that would um, give me some form of excitement to my day. It'd bring me up to a level where I was functional sort of thing. Okay. Just having this communication with him. We would have the occasional phone calls for maybe, it'd be 10 minutes. That's where I'd get for the week, oh. which was good. But it was also tough because there's not much you can say in 10 minutes when you're uh. not talking for a month, a week at a time. Yeah, you don't um, even sort of warm up to it, do you, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah speed that was really speed dating, anyway. 
Yeah. Um, so mum could see I was at my lowest point that I've been because he was off doing his thing and had his life, well, that part of his life was figured out and I felt stuck in what I was doing with the beauty therapy and taste. It was like, oh, I like it, but I'm not loving it sort of thing. And I was stuck with that. Not knowing who I was, where I was going, I felt lost not having, like, he's one of my best friends. Not having him there to support me was really tough too. Um, so mum and I, well, my parents and I decided that it was best for me to start antidepressants just to get that little bit of help because it's been four years of such a tough battle with, um, without that extra help, we decided, look, it's gotten really bad. We'll just see how this goes. And so we've tried that and that, um, I thought that helped a lot. What is um, the difference? So like, could you explain? I haven't experienced what what is the difference from the feeling of low to actually taking the antidepressants the um the feeling of low it's like i didn't want to get out of bed i couldn't get up i couldn't eat i couldn't keep food down um i wouldn't want to talk to anybody talking to somebody even my closest family i would just it would just frustrate me i'd be like really irritable all the time like and that's not who I am as a person no I love talking to people (laughs) I love being around people um yeah I stopped doing the things I loved I didn't go out of the house I didn't keep drawing or painting which I really love doing so I really I lost myself really okay and I felt lost too um but when I started taking the antidepressants it it kind of gave me a boost I wouldn't say it made me completely better it just gave me that extra boost to make sure I got out of bed and I ate some food and I was just up and functioning sort of thing right so it did Um, something but not a lot yeah like it helped or it it clearly helped you could see that because I was functioning I was up I was alive yes um but then we decided that I might need something a little more because I was slowly coming back, but I wasn't back to myself. Um, so that's when we decided to look into kinesiology. And that has been the most amazing experience of my life. It's amazing. I am back to myself again. Finally, I'm back to myself and a little bit more. What I mean, kinesiology is a, a, a strange thing to um for people to understand because there's I was just talking to someone on a coaching course that there's the woo-woo kinesiology right through to the very experienced practitioner what do you could you explain to someone what your experience of kinesiology is um so my experience I have to say it there is that part of therapy where you get to talk with someone and they and you share your experience and with this I found it was there was so much more flow to it. It was so much more comfortable. It didn't feel forced. It was okay. like, okay, the way you're feeling, it's natural. It's understandable. You're grieving. You're struggling within yourself. It's natural, but it's not normal. So we can help you get that back. Whereas with my psychologist, it was like, oh, you're that's normal. Mm. Yeah, so it's not helpful. It was, so this is helpful yeah. to you. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and so with the kinesiology, they explained um like all the reactions in my brain and how my emotions are reacting with my body and how that's all so like when I'm feeling anxious I'll shake or I'll my breathing will speed up and they tell me they were teaching me how that all connected to my brain so what I was feeling it was natural that's how your body naturally reacts but it's not normal for you to feel like this all the time it's an indication that something's wrong yeah, which yeah. is really good because I finally felt, wow, someone understands. Like, Yay. I can't control this, but I want to I want to learn how. Mm. Uh, and so then there was a kinesiology side of it where I was able to connect with my body. Um, I'm currently learning. I'm doing some outside study of kinesiology. I'm looking into um, chakras and that sort of thing. Oh, yes. Chakras yeah. are like the energy systems in your body. 
And so we were talking about that in kinesiology and how to connect with myself with my body, which I've also struggled with, um, with being self-conscious about myself, which is, uh, it's such a big problem. I know for people everywhere, all ages, races, everything, it's such a massive issue. People are too focused on what they look like and how society is accepting them for the way they look. Whereas with this kinesiology, we've been looking at how my body works, what my body's doing for me, being thankful that I can walk, I can breathe, I can think. Focusing on what my body does rather than what it looks like has really, I've gotten so much more confidence back. I'm not worrying about what he's thinking or she's thinking or I'm worrying about me and myself. Goes beautiful work to do for yourself at um, the age of 18. You know, to see yeah. up, isn't it? Goodness, how many yeah. people touch that type of stuff until they're in their um, you know, their forties or fifties once the, once the kids have all gone, uh, they start to do yeah. that type of work. So yeah, it's amazing that you're actually uh, you're giving yourself that experience too to to grow. Yeah, it's been really amazing. I've yeah, I've come back to who I was before all the depression, and I've become stronger within myself mm. with everything that's going on around me, which has been really great. Mm, so role model as we talked before sounds to me like you're actually very much a role model for um the other other women who have experienced similar and I think even like I mean obviously your your family all would have been grieving I imagine too with your your grandparents so that was quite a um even just looking at the whole picture there was a lot going on for you um not just for yourself let alone dealing with anyone else yeah. being sad in the family. So Yeah. But yeah, I was really lucky that I have such a supportive family as well. Mm. Which really amazing. Even if my siblings originally they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know, oh why is why has Lucy locked herself in her room? Why isn't she coming out you know? They would still when they saw me they'd still be there like, Hey, like do you wanna come chat, do you wanna come hang out sort of thing. So always there for me, even if they were like totally confused with what was going on yeah. and why their sister had like totally slipped into this new person. My parents were always there to, they were like checking on me, supporting me, you know, they weren't forcing me to do anything, they didn't force me to speak out to them, they didn't force me to do this or that, it was all, they just supported me to the point where I felt comfortable to talk to them and reach out. Your love, isn't it, when it comes down to it? Yeah. 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 Hey, um, do you you see um, through all this, do you have sort of some type of connection to spirituality or um, I know Linda Lee the other week talked about religion. How do you um, see yourself? Do you connect with anything? Um, So I've always grown up surrounded by Christianity. I went to a Christian college for my senior schooling, so for grade 11 and 12, and at primary school and my previous high school we would do religion but it was only ever Christianity we wouldn't be exposed to anything else I never really was exposed to anything besides that part of religion um, until I got out of school and I really wanted to look into it myself because I've always been interested to see what other people believe in and I've struggled with it because I feel like there is more to what's on this physical earth there is more around us. Um, but I just struggled because I couldn't fit inside the box of Christianity and what the Bible says and what you should and shouldn't be. This whole thing with um, being gay and all these things that you do, like I know Mum was saying the other week um, in her podcast about the penalties of sin being death or whatever. I know, crazy, eh? And how... And how God loves everybody, but if you're a woman who loves another woman, that's punishable. Like I, I just didn't understand how contradicting the whole thing was, and I couldn't believe in everything that was said um, under this, like across the spectrum of Christianity. So I couldn't really believe in that. So I always told myself, "Oh, you must be an atheist because you don't believe in this." set of religion or this set or this set and so that was hard for me because I do within me there is some part of me that is spiritual because there is something 
I do believe there's more than what's right here in front of us. Yeah. Um, and we have been touching on spirituality with my kinesiology and we looked at how being spiritual isn't about fitting in a box of a set religion. It's about finding what makes sense to you, what makes you thrive, what makes you feel loved and happy and being able to portray that into the world in a way that you can. So with myself, my spirituality, it's like um, with my painting and my art, I put love and creativity into that and I put that in, out to the world for people to enjoy. I work with kids. I absolutely love working with kids and I get to now do that for a job. Wow. Like going to do exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm finding out who I am as a person through this journey with spirituality without forcing myself to fit within a box. Okay. Kind of my own beliefs and morals. And yeah, it's a lot. It's hard to understand, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's I know. Really it's, it's quite a journey all through all through life that you go through trying to understand that. Like, again, similar to what Lynn Lee said, you know, she's still in that sort of tug of war where she was with you know, her thoughts about God. Um, yeah. But yeah, you, you, and you with the you know making your own box is a pretty amazing aha to have already. Yeah. That, that you're getting to do that. Um, do you think that? Um, with your message in terms of um, your anxiety and depression, what you experienced, the lessons you went through to overcome it, is there anything particular if someone was experiencing that and listening to this right now that you could actually tell them would be a good idea, what the first thing they could do? Um, i definitely reach out to start with. Find your support system, find someone um, that you love and someone who loves and cares for you that you feel comfortable with and just reach out, tell them how you're feeling and then just by doing that first step, getting it off your shoulders and having someone else there to support and understand you, that's a massive, massive thing that'll really help you get through this journey and this battle just by reaching out your hand and saying, can someone please help me? I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's hard, isn't it? I know, as you said, like in, in the space that you've got yourself into, um, because you know you were down in that that low low low. Yeah. It must be hard to put your hand up if you're not someone like yourself who knew because you've been studying it or understood it. Yeah, I know it's definitely a struggle for some people because there is that stigma around mental health and mm. how it's not something people are taught to talk about. It's not something like with your physical health, you can easily talk about you should be eating this, you should be running, you should be doing exercise, blah, 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 you should be sleeping well, whatever. Mm. The physical health is something that is so much easier to talk about, but for some reason, mental health isn't. And so there isn't, I don't believe there's enough, like in schools specifically, there isn't enough education around mental illness and mental health. So I know just having that stigma there is something really really difficult in reaching out and asking for help mm. I know that if I was brought up in a different family I would have struggled because within our family we talk about those sort of things it's not something that we hide behind so it was easier for me to reach out but I know for some people it's not something that's talked about so it's hard to say can someone help me like I know I'm struggling I just need someone to talk to mm. so it's hard as well I, I, I suppose I'm a mum of three older girls and I sort of see on uh, Instagram, say, the amount of messages coming at you around anxiety, depression, um, boundaries, all sorts of stuff. What do you feel about the Instagram and that are doing to your age group? Uh, is it good for you or bad for you? Social media I find is really bad. Mm. I find, even though I am on social media, but I'm at a point where it's like I'm there to share what I want to share and not worry about what other people are thinking of me. Whereas originally when I first started on social media, it was all about how your page looks, how aesthetic you are, how well you look, how many followers you have, how many likes you have, all this nonsense. 
yeah um that social media builds your worth or who you are as a person like if you didn't have this many followers you weren't as good as this person and it was really really hard I felt that really did impact myself with my anxiety specifically because it was like I'd spend hours and hours and hours getting ready just to go to school where mm. I'd have a uniform I'd just have to eat brush my hair brush my teeth go to school whereas I would put on my uniform so I'd make sure that I didn't look too big but I didn't look too small and make sure my shoes were the cool brand or the most popular brand and make sure that I had my makeup done and my hair done and put on jewelry where I could like I just to get ready for school just to learn which is insane and once I got to high school that's when it got bad when yeah. I first started high school that's when it was really bad um as I got older in grade 11 and 12 it became more about the school it became more about my schoolwork my friendships and it wasn't about what I looked like thank goodness no. because that took up so much of my mental capacity is worrying about what people thought of me um purely based on who I was on the outside rather than who I was on the inside. So sort of kind of freeing not to be in that space anymore. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. It's great not to have to think about what I look like and make sure someone, make sure that person thinks I'm pretty and this person likes the way my hair looks today. And it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And no. I feel social media, it's all about what you look like on the outside yeah. and how you portray yourself to be on social media can be completely different to who you are as a person which uh, I just don't like it <laughs> no no I, I find it it's um it's interesting I sort of wonder what will happen if both you know Facebook or Instagram or even I was on Snapchat you know just crashed at some stage you know what's that going yeah. to do to people's way of growing as a young person if they've not got that platform we didn't have that platform life would be good <laughs> I know um mum would tell me about how they didn't have phones and they didn't have social media so it wasn't about how you looked it was about going out and enjoying life and spending time with the people that you love and making those connections in real life yeah. having those friends having that support network being able to go out and have fun it wasn't about sitting in your room taking a selfie and hoping you get a hundred likes on it yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that that's changed, or maybe I just don't know anyone who does those type of selfies anymore. But um, I mean, I suppose we all saw it for a few years. But um, do you think it's diminishing? Is it starting to drop? Um, I'd say a little bit. Yeah. Um, there are some. I follow a few people on social media who have really helped me come out of my shell and not focus on likes or whatever. Um. And focus on the way I look, which having those people with that higher platform be able to tell the younger generation, look, it doesn't matter what you look like, it matters what's inside you mm. and what you want to do with yourself and who you are as a person. That's been really great. Um, so I'd say it is dropping off a little bit. There is still a long way to go because I see, even if I see younger, like 12, 13, 14 year old girls, they're all about what they look like uh, okay and it's it's like I, I just I just want to see who you are I just want to experience you as a person rather than seeing this person you've created purely because of what society thinks a person should look like do you feel at all now that you're you finished school you you're finding yourself a lot and you're about to go and actually you know be a leader of children do you feel um, all the lessons you've learnt you'll be able to take with you to share? Is, is your mission at all to, to share what you've learnt? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. I hope that we can start introducing mental illness into, like, education of mental illness into younger generations mm. because I found that you only start learning about it once you're in high school or even in your later years of high school. And it's not really, you don't really learn it from the education system. It's kind of what you find out by yourself along the way. 
grad love to be able to educate younger people in a way that is obviously sensitive to their age group without yeah. like attacking yeah. them with these horrible horrible stories um but just by starting off younger and having them have that little bit of knowledge and knowing that it's okay to feel this way but there are ways that you can help yourself yeah there are people who are there for you to help you get out of this rut so I think mm. I want to be able to help people realize that what matters is who you are on the inside and what makes you come alive and what makes you feel happy and thrive and it's not about it's not about what you look like or what society perceives you as which I'd love to just bring that to younger children so that they have that foundation to grow with as they get into high school where it gets really challenging for them and into adulthood. So you may well be part of future change for kids at school with your I really shift. hope so. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing thing to do. You know, I think everything I've found in coaching is, God, if you could actually get to people when when they're younger, um, you save a hell of a lot of mucking around and mistakes and mm. pain that people you know finally start to do the work on themselves so late in life you know so yeah you, know, you can help people at that young age that they can at least even have a conversation about something it would be a pretty incredible impact so do you have um we'll wind up now because we're getting um to the end of our a bit of a, a chat time do you have any particular like a, a mantra you follow or a quote or something that makes you sort of get back on top of things when you're down? Um, I wouldn't say I have a mantra or a quote. I always, if I'm feeling down or whatever, I just like to think to myself um, about who I am on the inside, which I've been saying over and over again, I know. <laughs> but I just really want to focus on who I am. Mm build myself up to who I was and, okay you know, yeah like I'm I'm an amazing person I can do amazing things yeah everyone's good. amazing in their own way good enough mantra that's good yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey um and who do you follow any particular band or type of music or you know what do you have you got a favorite song that makes you dance around the house oh that's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> I don't like a specific genre. I don't like a specific artist. I just like whatever makes me feel good that day. Mm, I can imagine that with the family you live in. That yeah. To enjoy music. Yeah. No. no, I don't. I couldn't give a specific song or specific artist. You're not the first. It's okay. I just I just chuck that yeah. in there at the end just in case. Seeing as it's on Spotify and iTunes, at least people can go and have a look if there was something. But, hey, yeah. um. I just want to say thank you. Um, it's pretty, um, to me, like uh, this is only a new podcast series for me, so I'm sort of still sort of finding my way, but you're episode 10 and you're in the 10 to 19. Um, and as I said to the other people who put their hand up in this first um, group of people is I would love to have you come back and maybe share a little bit more, um, you know, as, as I move along. Um, my goal is to get to 40 podcasts of women from every decade of life. Um, so that after that, then I'd love to go back on the second round. So would you love to be able to share? You probably by then are oh, nearly at uni. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm at uni. <laughs> I'm dying to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so would you like to come back again in the future? Yeah, I'd love to come back. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you again. As I said, this is you don't realise the value of sharing words and I think at this time when everyone's a little bit disconnected, um, people are just enjoying just, you know, tuning in and just taking away a message that might help them, it might help their daughter, it might help their sister or a friend. So, um, yeah, very courageous of you to share your story today and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, anytime. Very fun. <laughs> What a beautiful girl. Um, I had that extra joy of sitting here opposite Lucy while we were on a Zoom call and just watching someone of her age easily answer those questions and, you know, the sharing of something that maybe she may not realise is so valuable to so many women of every age group. Uh, it's just, yep, yeah, she blows me away. So once again, that was 
the last episode in our first series up to 10 and I think it was a lovely way to end on. What I would like to do is just put out there that if anything is resonating with you from anyone's story or you particularly like a particular woman's whole journey, please don't hesitate to let me know or give me feedback because each one of them, as you may have heard, has said, yes, they'd come back again. I don't have to wait till it's up to number 40. You can uh, have them come back earlier. And they said they're, they're all absolutely beautiful women and they'll be more than happy to share um, parts of their story because I know a lot of the stories so far have been quite um, generalised and that's just how we flowed with it in this first 10. And I think COVID-19 um, and the pressure of that on our our minds and souls at the moment. That's I think it's just been a gentle way to, to move into this series. Uh, if you know any women too that you believe sort of have a story to tell, many of them will say they don't have a story to tell, but you know they do, have a chat with them and just say, hey, this is something. And as Linda Lee said when she put her hand up and I think Janine did too, they said, I would love to contribute to this series. So put it out there because there's women out there, I'm, I'm talking about every decade of life. If you know that there's even snippets of someone's story will be something that will benefit someone else. Um, a bit like what Lucy said, she just said, no, this will actually be there um, and it will be of value to someone to hear this. Then you just tell them to contact me. Uh, if it's you, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm very easy just to, to chat with and we can work it out and it's so non-confrontational when we're uh, doing the recording. We can stop, start, laugh, giggle, anything we want and we'll, we'll make it happen. So yeah, as, as this series finishes at episode 10 next week, we are going to go on to the topic of acceptance without regret. Uh, the person who's coming on is Lisa Williams and she will talk about how she's shifted her energy of her struggle um, as a young mum with depression and you know, the care of special needs kids working full time to be an absolutely different woman you know, eight years later. So much so, I had to go over, over to her and find out what the hell's happened. And yeah, she's got a really good story to tell and I think you'll enjoy that. So yes, please don't hesitate to give me feedback and I really hope you can join me for the next 10 episodes of our series. Thank you very much. Bye.